If you're watching this video and you're interested in cinematography, chances are you think that this image here of me in my backyard isn't very good. There, there aren't typical cinematic qualities to this image that you would normally associate with cinematic imagery. Now, some of you may know instinctually that this image is not cinematic, but you don't quite know why. Now, in this video, I would like to attempt to accomplish the insurmountable task of describing what a cinematic image is and breaking it down, discussing the traits and qualities that typically would make up a cinematic image as we know it. Now this is a cinematic image, so stick around at the end of this video to see why this image is cinematic on an objective, an implicit, a contextual, and subjective level. But first, I would like to complain about the word cinematic. I think it's overused, misunderstood, and highly loaded. Now, the reason why I think cinematic is a loaded term and why I think the word cinematic is overused is because it's an all-encompassing term that can mean so many different things. Unfortunately, when it is said, I think it means different things to different people. Now, not only do I think the word cinematic means very different things to different people now, I also think that throughout time, the word cinematic, although not used in the past as much, has meant different things. For example, movies from the 1950s or movies from the 1970s may not be considered cinematic by today's standards. In fact, even in the last 15 years, the advent of digital filmmaking has changed what we consider to be cinematic. Now, to simplify this idea, I do think that in one sense, what we consider to be cinematic, we also consider to be beauty. Now, in our postmodern world, the term beauty isn't used much anymore. After all, cinematography isn't always aiming for beauty. However, I do think it's impossible to ignore the fact that the look of the movies we enjoy today are highly influenced by the traits and qualities of the last 500 years of Western art. Trying to deconstruct what makes a good image has been very difficult for me. And I've been searching for like a unifying theory of everything when it comes to beauty, trying to explain what draws us, what entertains us, and what connects us emotionally to good art. Now, I would like you to know that I am a college dropout, and as a cinematographer, I have worked a lot in practical terms, and what I've learned has been from practical experience. Now, some of you out there who actually went to film school may have official film school terms to refer to these things by, but alas, I've had to make up my own to kind of come to peace with the word cinematic. So in this video, you will be accosted by different terms, and if you look them up in a dictionary or try to find them in film books, you may not. Now, recently I was reading this book on directing, and I came across a term. They mentioned Hegelian dialectics, and because of my ADHD, I ended up going down a very long rabbit hole, at which kind of blew my mind. Now, there's a lot of controversy surrounding this, and people will get quite uppity, but Hegelian dialectics can be summarized with three words. Thesis, antithesis, and synthesis. And for those philosophy nerds out there, I know he never spoke those words, but it is a good introduction into Hegelian philosophy. Now, whether accurately or inaccurately, Hegel argued that all of society, human nature, history, scientific development, and all of humanity can be summarized by this nonlinear thinking of thesis, antithesis, and synthesis. Here's one way to understand it. Somebody presents an idea, that person or another person presents the antithesis to that idea or the opposite of it, and then eventually a synthesis is reached. Here's an example for you. Hollywood movies used to be shot on film with big film cameras, and then digital technology was introduced, but it was primitive. Now these are two competing ideas. They're opposites in many ways. And then what do they make? a beautiful baby, which is a digital cinema camera. Both ideas coming together with a synthesis. Now, seeing the world through this way, uh, it's not linear, it's more cyclical. And human behavior and advancements in technology using this method can be understood and sometimes even predicted. 
Now, before we talk more about cinematography, I would also like to say that thesis, antithesis, and synthesis can also be related to the basic movie plot. Now, most main character movie heroes will have a philosophical protagonist and a philosophical antagonist who represent different ideas, and the hero must choose and take the lessons they've learned to achieve their own uh, self-identification. This was clearly used in Star Wars as Luke Skywalker has two philosophical uh, examples in his life, Obi-Wan Kenobi and Darth Vader, and they both represent two battling ideologies, and Luke Skywalker is stuck in the middle as the synthesis of this generational story, but what does he do? He chooses the light side, but he wears black, perhaps in remembrance of the fact that he needs to be careful that the evil is in him, just waiting that he needs to embrace the possibility that he could end up like his dad if he's not careful. Now, to correlate this Hegelian dialectic method of thinking to cinematography, I've decided to break the idea of cinematography into four different categories. They include the objective, the implicit, the contextual, and the subjective. Now, these are my terms and definitions, but as we go through each one, I think it'll help you understand everything that goes into a cinematic image more accurately. And don't worry, I'm gonna go through examples and show exactly how this applies. Now, again, the goal here is to reach a synthesis through two opposing ideas. So let's talk about the objective category that I've identified under cinematography. I think this has three subsections of shape, texture, and color. Now, personally, I think shape is the core of a, an objective cinematic image. And what I mean by that is that shape is identified in the human mind through shade. And at the extreme levels of these two shades, we have white and black. I think I'm getting ahead of myself here. Let's start this way. Imagine you were just born and all you know is this white screen. You haven't been exposed to anything else in the world, only this color white. And then magically, half of your field of view becomes black. And now you're presented with two realities, white and black. And those are both expressed. That white is the original thesis, and what is the antithesis to white? It is black. What is the synthesis of white and black? Gray, something in the middle. So when we have an object on screen, we truly can't see the shape of it until we see those shades. Let me explain this visually. Here we are, the sun is right in my face, and my face appears very flat. You do see these shadows under my eyes and neck, but besides that, this image is very flat looking. However, if I face the camera more towards the sun here, we have a light part of my face and a dark part of my face. Both values are represented, uh, revealing more of a shape to my face. And really, that's the core of cinematography right there. Um, we're done, right? Just kidding, it gets a little bit more complicated than this. Uh, any color can be a thesis, but what is the antithesis of that color? Well, it's whatever color is on the opposite side of the spectrum, or perhaps whatever color looks very nice with that other color. If everything in your image is a different shade of brown, uh, it's not gonna be as interesting as an image that represents different colors on opposite ends of the spectrum. So you have an original color like red, you have an antithesis to that color, like green, and together, red and green make a synthesis. A beautiful combination that uh, will make your cinematography a little bit better. And lastly, different types of textures can be used in conjunction with each other to exaggerate other ones. For example, if there's something super soft, put something super spiky or rough by it to accentuate or complement the softness of that previous object. See, we're really playing with opposites here, or contrast. Contrast is a simple way to understand the core of cinematography. 
As an example for the objective analysis of cinematography, let's look at this frame from Joker. First, to look at shape, let's make it black and white. Now, what I'm seeing here is a fairly even distribution of the light and the dark. They're both being represented, and if we look at the Joker's face, we can see that one side of his face is brighter than the other. This way, we get a sense of the shape on his face. In terms of color, what I'm seeing here is a great relationship between the Joker's jacket that he's wearing and the side of this bus. Those two colors look very nice together. And remember, this is really about expressing the great quality qualities of each color. We can't truly see orange for what it is if we've never seen blue before. Also, looking at the texture here, we see the sharpness of the rivets and the water droplets on the windows and the face of the Joker in comparison to the soft bokeh of the background. But it does get more interesting than this. Let's cross the line and raise our mental capacities here beyond the objective image into the implicit reality of cinematography. Now, as we speak of the implicit subject matter of cinematography, I think this can be broken down into, well, one category, really, perspective, which is achieved through the camera's physical location in space and the lens being used. Let me show you some examples. First, with these examples, we can implicitly tell that the camera is very close to the subject. Without even thinking about it, we know that we are invited into the space of these actors. On the other extreme end, we have telephoto shots. We can implicitly tell here that the camera is farther away from the subject. We are a bit removed from the action and the subject with a comfortable distance. This completely changes our approach to the image. Additionally, with perspective, the cinematographer has the opportunity to play with varying sizes of objects to implicitly let us know who the main character is. Well, likely it's the larger subject. Also, the camera can be placed in an artistic way so that leading lines point to our subject's face. This camera perspective, favoring beauty and symmetry over just an objective average lens, average eye level view, is really a statement, and I think this kind of camera work is akin to a flowery passage in a book, maybe a bit perhaps self-indulgent, but nevertheless artistic and pleasing. Now, with this category, understanding film on a contextual level, we've moved well above the, our abilities to understand cinematography on an objective or an implicit level. What I mean is, now we are bringing our human experience to the frame. This is not just what we see anymore. The example I like to use here is an elephant and a mouse. Why do we always see an elephant and a mouse together on film? Well, I think the reason why is to truly understand the largeness and greatness of a huge elephant. We should also see the perspective of a small creature so that the two extremes create interest and drama and conflict. My favorite example of contextual cinematography is R2-D2 and C-3PO, and they perfectly correlate with thesis, antithesis, synthesis. One robot is tall and skinny, the other one is short and fat. One is made for leisurely living as a butler, the other one is made for utility. And together they are a perfect pair. Why do they complement each other? Well, because a thesis and antithesis have been met with synthesis. Together they create a cinematic image in my mind because of how well they complement each other in their diversity. Now, the contextual category in film really has to do with the film itself, the movie experience, and chronology as a whole. What experience in the movie realm is an audience bringing to the table? What have you shown them in previous shots that would make the current shot they're looking at extra special? Here's an example from 1917. If you haven't seen this movie, skip this part. This is the opening image of the movie. Uh, our main character is sitting by a tree, and it is impossible to know the cinematic and emotional and dramatic weight that this shot holds when you haven't seen the end of the movie. Likewise, once you've seen the end of the movie, how he comes and sits by another tree, representing perhaps the motherly return to his home emotionally or a catharsis of some kind, 
Both of these shots in conjunction with each other hold a certain contextual weight that is understood within the parameters of the movie itself, and it's a sort of a payoff that we receive. What I'm trying to say is, these shots don't live in a vacuum. They connect with each other. Now, before we move on to the last section, I want to say that a lot of the examples that I've used in this video came from a website called Shot Deck, and I'm very grateful for what they do. They are not a sponsor of this video, and they have nothing to do with me. I'm just bringing it up because on this website, Cinematographers, people in the industry can go through and see a bunch of different shots from movies. And yes, it is helpful to be able to see these freeze-framed shots from movies and extrapolate knowledge from them, look at where the camera was, and all that other stuff. But by itself, that's no better than photography, right? Cinematography is its own art form. And we aren't looking at pictures. We're looking at, well, we are, we're looking at 24 frames a second, which gives us the illusion of motion. So cinematography is best watched in motion. And this is where the idea of mesenscene comes from, and I'm sure I didn't pronounce that right. But now we have moved above all of our other categories into what I call the subjective realm of cinematography, which is definitely the most important, and I think the least talked about. This last realm of cinematography is what separates the common cinematographer from the master in this industry. In fact, I think this applies to all art forms of any kind. Uh, when an artist is tapping into something, that's what this is. Now, to explain the subjective in cinematography, I'm going to bring you deep into the rainforest, to the cargo cults and the objects that they've made. It was a fascinating time in history when we discovered that these small, isolated tribes had witnessed from a distance cargo planes landing on these airstrips. They saw the headphones that the technicians wore, and they saw chainsaws from workers cutting down their trees. Then the cargo colts took twigs, leaves, coconuts, anything they could find really, and tried their very best to replicate this technology, worshipping it from a distance. The reason why I bring this up is because if your wedding video or short film or student film or commercial looks cinematic, I hate to break it to you, but you're no better than a cargo cult in the Amazon. Playing with your sticks and twigs and leaves, trying to replicate a sophistication that you couldn't possibly understand. Don't worry, I'm in the same boat as well. From where I stand, the very best that I can do is try to replicate a cinematic image without actually achieving it. Because a real cinematic image is only achieved when incredible artists, writers, and actors come together to make a work of art that is entertaining, compelling, and adds value to the human experience. So ultimately, the word cinematic is so overused because amateurs like you and me needed a specific word that ultimately means my stick plane looks like a real plane, right? Also, when we think of contextual and subjective payoffs in film, this can really explain why limited series TV shows have become so popular. In many of these shows, some small comment or shot in the first episode can heavily relate to something in a later season. The amount of contextual and subjective material that the audience can consume with television is sometimes greater than some of the best movies because they've been brought along this chronology of information that buries them in the content. Also, on this subjective audience participatory level of entertainment, many movies for me have been tainted. For example, I cannot say that this frame is cinematic to me. All I think about is the meme. Now, the last reason why I feel like this subjective category of cinematography is the greatest and most important of all is because of this reason. Remember that example from 1917? On a subjective level, the director of that movie, Sam Mendes, his grandfather served in World War I. And that is his subjective experience that he's bringing to this movie, which really qualified him as a famous movie director, as a really smart person, and as a person who's heard first-hand stories about World War I, it puts him in a great position to be able to put his artistic abilities into this project. And that's why people always say that you should make movies and do projects that inspire you. 
Another way to see this shot is through the story that the crew told. They said that all throughout production, this was their pee tree. And so when they watch this part of the movie, they remember that they peed all over it. And the actor here is sitting in their pee. Not the subjective interpretation that I would like to have in my brain when I look at this image, but now it is burned in my brain and now it's part of the movie for me. That's the subjective, unfortunately. Okay, so let's finally break down this frame from No Country for Old Men. On an objective level, a lot of different shades are being expressed. Everything from white to black, there's a lot of good shape development here. Color-wise, the frame looks balanced, and there's a variety of textures being displayed. On an implicit level, not much is being stated here. We are well within the action, just behind this man's shoulder, so we do feel close to the action, but this is a fairly neutral shot. On a contextual level, as we've gotten to this point in the film, we know that this man is a killer, and he appears to kill without reason. We are worried for this gas station attendant, heightening the drama in the scene. On a subjective poetic level, the lighting on this man's face is very contrasted. One side of his face appears to be in darkness and the other side in light. And what is he going to be doing in a minute? He flips a coin. This really is poetically saying to us that perhaps this man will kill him, perhaps he won't. It is a perfect divided line, kind of like Two-Face on The Dark Knight. And ultimately, this shot is cinematic because it's part of an incredible story, put together by incredible storytellers and technicians, a story that means something artistically. So I would like to communicate with you and hear from you. What are your experiences in understanding the complicated word cinematic? And how have you tried to break it down in your brain to understand it so you can actually do your job or at least enjoy movies better. If you enjoyed this video and you want to watch more videos from this channel, don't. This channel sucks. 